Uh, can we stand our feet? Stand our feet. Tell the person beside you, say, I don't know what you're doing, but you just look fabulous. Now, they don't look that good. Come back. Week one, we talked about the foundation for the book of Revelation. We talked about who it was written by, who it was written to, why it was written. Week two, we talked about the rapture of the church. Week three, we talked about the Antichrist coming on the scene. Today, we come to Revelation chapter seven. We're going to go through the book of Revelation. If you want to understand it, you will understand it. If you will stay with me, you will understand the book of Revelation. And there's a special blessing promised to those, promised to those that study and apply the book of Revelation. Revelation 7 verse 1 says this. It says, after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal, notice that seal, the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees. Wait. Till we've sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. Till we've sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. Apparently, there'll be seals during the tribulation period. Some will be sealed with a mark. The mark of the beast in their foreheads. But the Bible says here, these 144,000, they're going to have a seal. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And they were sealed 144,000, wait, of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Let us pray. God, as we bow our heads and hearts in your presence, this book is inspired. And Lord, if it was written by the Holy Spirit, we can't understand it outside the Holy Spirit. So how ludicrous it would be together and not want the Holy Spirit in our midst. Because Lord, without you, God is the Spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So lead us today, direct us today, meet the needs of the people today. And for all you do, we're gonna praise you. For I pray this prayer with a grateful heart. For I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Till you come, amen. You may be seated. I want to talk to you about the 144,000 in Revelation. The 144,000 in the book of Revelation. In 1870, there was a man by the name of Charles Taz Russell. In 1870, Charles Taz Russell started a denomination called the Jehovah Witnesses. Charles Taz Russell, in 1879, they established the Watchtower Society. It was composed of nine men. Nine men who they said that literally God spoke to their denomination through these nine men. God spoke exclusively to the Watchtower Society through these nine men. They said this. They said the Jehovah Witness denomination is unequivocally the 144,000 mentioned in Revelation chapter 7 and in Revelation chapter 14. But something happened. By the year 1935, they had grown beyond 144,000. So they had to change things up. And they said this. They said the 144,000 are the elite Jehovah Witnesses. They will live on level number one of heaven. But on level number two of heaven, 99.9% of the Jehovah Witnesses we live, and that's here on earth. And then for us that are not Jehovah Witnesses, they said, what is going to happen to us? We're going to die. And then they say, we're going to be recreated. And after we're recreated, we'll be given a period of time to accept the teachings of the Jehovah Witnesses. And if we don't accept the teachings of the Jehovah Witnesses, we will be eternally annihilated. 
You say, Pastor, that's interesting. Yes, that's interesting. It's good. But the only problem with it is the Bible. The only problem with it is what God's Word says. Because, see, God's Word is very clear in Revelation chapter 7, verse 4, that the 144,000 are of all the tribes of the children of Israel. <laughs> the Bible is pretty clear, folks. Whether we like it or not, they're not Gentiles. They're Jews. Amen? I mean, it's not the Jehovah Witnesses. It's not you. It's not me. Because the Bible is very clear. It's 144,000 Jews. Now, as I was putting this message together, I thought, folks, I, don't, I, I said, God, I don't want to lose the people. I don't want to lose the people. I want, to, I want them to see how this is relevant to their lives. And I don't want to lose you today. I want them to see how it's relevant. And I want to make three statements that will help you apply this to your life. Look here. Statement number one is there's no promise too hard for God to keep. Isn't that good, folks? There's 8,000 promises in the Word of God. And the good news this morning, there's no promise too hard for God to keep. 2 Peter 3 and 9 says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Uh, Hebrews 10 and 23 says, says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith, for he is faithful that hath promised. That's good news. There's not a promise too hard for God to keep. Now, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 49, verse 6, this is what the Bible says. The Bible says that of the tribes of Jacob or of the tribes of Israel, they're going to take the lot to the Gentiles. Now, that was written, as I say, 700 years before Christ. How are the Jews going to take the gospel to the Gentiles? If I took you to Israel today, there are 7 million Jews living in Israel. 7 million. You say, Pastor Benny, that's wonderful. How many of those 7 million Jews living in Israel are Christians? 1%. 1%. So they're definitely not taking the gospel to the Gentiles. When's that going to happen? That's going to happen, ladies and gentlemen, during the tribulation period when 144,000 Jews turn this world upside down. My goodness, look what God did with 12 disciples. And if he did that with 12 Jewish disciples, what's he going to do with 144,000 Jews? <laughs> it's going to be pretty amazing. Amen? So, so, so here's what I want you to see. As we look at those 144,000, I want you to see six or seven things right quickly. The first thing I want you to see, we want to learn about this 144,000. They're mentioned two places in the Bible. They're mentioned in Revelation chapter 7, and they're mentioned in Revelation chapter 14. The first thing we learn about these 144,000 is they are purchased. They're purchased. You say, well, preacher, what do you mean? Well, look what Revelation 14 verse 3 says. It says they are redeemed from the earth. What's it mean, Pastor Benny? They've been redeemed. They've been purchased. They've been washed <laughs> in the blood of Jesus Christ. <laughs> They've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. I want you to understand something. There's no special route for the Jewish people. They've got to come to faith in Christ just like everybody else. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power, power of God to the Jew first and also unto the Gentile. They've got to come under the blood just like everybody else. And the Bible says they've been redeemed. They've been redeemed. They've been washed in the blood. Now, here's the question we ask. Pastor, when do you think they give their lives to Christ? Well, at the beginning of the tribulation period, God's going to bring forth two witnesses. God's going to bring forth two witnesses According to Revelation chapter 11, verse 3. See, here's something I want you to see. God will always have a voice. God will always have a voice. God will, God will always have a man of God or a woman of God. God's always going to have a voice. And the Bible says at the beginning of tribulation, power was given unto my two witnesses. 
that they should prophesy a thousand two hundred three score days clothed in sackcloth. What does it say? It says, folks, that two witnesses are going to come on the scene and they're going to preach three and a half years. You say, Preacher Benny, who do you think it is? Well, I think it's Enoch and Elijah. And it, the Bible is pretty clear. The Bible is pretty clear. You remember Enoch? Enoch got to walk in so close with God. God said to Enoch, Enoch, it's closer to my house than yours. Go with me. And he took him on to heaven. Remember that? Do you people read your Bibles? He took him on with him. And then you remember Elijah. God took him to heaven in a whirlwind. Now, there's only one problem with that. Hebrews 9 and 27 says, it is appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment. So these two guys never did die. But they come back. And they're preaching the gospel. And 144,000 get saved. And look what verse 6 says. They have power to shut heaven that it rain not. Elijah did that. And then look what verse 7 says. And when they has, have finished their testimony. Folks, I want you to understand something. You're going to finish your testimony. Somebody said, Pastor Benny, I'm so worried about this and I'm so fearful about that. You don't have to be fearful about any of that. <laughs> because you're immutable until God is finished with you. You're immutable until God is finished with you. Until God wants you. Now, you don't have to live a life of fear because God's not giving you the spirit of fear. But of power and of love and of sound mind. You say, Brother Benny, does it bother you? No, no, to get in on airplanes and preaching and going, no, 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 no. If God wants me, he doesn't need an airplane to get me. Now, when they finish their testimony, wait. The Antichrist or the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. So, so after three and a half years, they're going to be killed. And look, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of that great city which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. What, what I'm saying, it's saying during this time, Jerusalem has become as corrupt as Sodom, where also our Lord was crucified. The city of God, Jerusalem, the Antichrist will kill them, and their dead bodies will lie in Jerusalem. Now, what's going to happen? And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nation shall see their dead bodies three and a half. Now keep it. John wrote this in 90 AD. How could all the nations see their dead bodies? It could not have happened in 90 AD. But by the way, folks, it can happen today. Because everything's instantly. Instantly. Because of advancements, because of technology, because of communication, everything is instant. And then the Bible says, after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. <laughs> and they stood up on their feet. And great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying to them, come up hither. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Let me tell you something. God wins. This is what I know. The 144,000, they're purchased. They heard the preaching of the gospel. But let me tell you something else. They are protected. They are protected. I didn't have time to share all this in the two early services. But see, the Bible says in Revelation 7 and 4, they're sealed. They're sealed. <laughs> that means divine protection. And, and, and you say, boy, I'd like to have that seal. Well, by the way, we've got a seal, folks. <laughs> According to Ephesians 4 and 30, we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. Amen? We've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now, they, they've got this divine protection. Look at Revelation chapter 9. It says, and the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. 
Who is that star? That star is Lucifer. And Lucifer fell out of heaven to the earth. And he was given the key of the bottomless pit. Somebody said, Pastor, hail, the lake of fire, the bottomless pit. Is, it's all one, it's, it's the same place. No, 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 I, I don't have time to expound today, but I will. Hail, the lake of fire, and the bottomless pit are three different places. The bottomless pit is the abiding place for demonic spirits. The Bible teaches us, the Bible teaches us in Luke chapter 8, verse 31, that the bottomless pit, the deep, is the abiding place for demonic spirits. Now we go back to our text. And he opened the bottomless pit, the abiding place for demonic spirits. And there arose smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by the reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And there was given them power as scorpions of the earth to have power. And he was commanded that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither the green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Locusts will come out of this bottomless pit, sting people with the sting of a scorpion. They could sting everybody but those that had been sealed. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but they should torment them five months. That the, that's the lifespan of a locust. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when it strike at the man. All I'm trying to say, ladies and gentlemen, why would anybody want to be here? I read Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. It's at the end of the tribulation period. And I noticed at the end of the tribulation period, there wasn't 143,999. There was 144,000 because God brought them through. And ladies and gentlemen, God will bring us through too. Now get this, they're purchased. They're protected. But I want you to do something else. They are pure. Folks, we want to be used of God. We need to be pure. Look what the scripture says. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. You say, preacher, do you think, does it mean they're physical virgins? I don't know if it actually means they're physical virgins, but what it's representing is purity in their lives. If we want God to use our lives, folks, we got to be pure. See, we're in this world in contact, but we shouldn't be in this world in conduct. And we're not going to make any difference until we are different. God's not called us to be like the world. The Bible teaches that we're to be different from this world. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Get this, be not conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Folks, I don't want to have a church that moves with the world. I want to have a church that moves the world, that makes a difference in people's lives. Somebody said, but oh, preacher, you can be so heavenly minded. You're of no earthly good. But get real, folks. We're so earthly minded that we're no heavenly good. And God's called us to be different. They're purchased. They're protected. They're pure. Get this. They're provided for. According to Revelation chapter 6, verse 6, there'll be a famine like there's never, ever been. A man will work all day for a quart of wheat. 
Millions of people will starve to death. But God's going to take care of the 144,000 because they have the seal of the living God. And friend, let me tell you something. If you know Christ, God's going to take care of you. If you know Christ, God's going to take care of you. Nobody's your source. God is your source. God is your source. My entire Christian life, my life verse has been this verse. I've been young. And by the way, at one time I was. And when I started using that life verse, I was young. I've been young and now I'm old. Yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Folks, God's going to see you through. God's going to provide for you. He's Jehovah Jireh, and he's more than enough. Amen? <laughs> they're purchased, they're protected, they're pure, they're provided for. But can I tell you something else? They are persistent. Look what verse 4 says. It says, uh, they follow the Lord whithersoever he goeth. Persistence. It's what got the snail on the ark, amen? <laughs> Persistent. I, I, go, I, I get up each morning at about 5 o'clock, and I got up this morning, and I went to the gym, and I got back, and Barbara said, was anybody there with you? And I said, no, no, no. If you go Sunday morning at 5 o'clock, you'll be all alone. But I said, Barbara, I, I had the best time. She said, why? I said, I sang the whole time. And nobody was in there. And I started singing, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I don't know what you're going. I don't know what you're battling. But I'll tell you, just turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I don't know what you're going through, but don't look at anything. Don't look at anybody. Don't look at any situation. Young lady, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Oh, glory be to God. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I'll tell you something else about them. They were preachers. Yeah, they're preachers. <laughs> I mean, the Bible says in Revelation 7 and 3, they're servants. Somebody said, preacher, I, I can't wait to get to heaven. How come? Well, I just want to be able to relax. No, no, you might want to do your relaxing here. You say, what do you mean? Well, look what the Bible says we're going to do when we get to heaven. We're going to serve him around his temple. Whew. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. It's going to be hard on some of you because you hadn't done any serving here. <laughs> now, you hadn't done any serving here. Your favorite songs, I Should Not Be Moved. See, folks, we can't sing standing on the promises if all we want to do is sit on the premises. We're going to serve. The Bible says they'll preach. And Brother Benny, what's going to happen? Well, the Bible tells us what's going to happen. Large numbers of people, large numbers of people will come to faith. Let me tell you the second thing I learned. There's not a person too hard for God to save. <laughs> There's not a person too hard for God. Isn't that good, folks? Isn't that so good? There's not a person too hard for God. Look what Revelation chapter 7 says. These guys are going to preach. After this, I beheld a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. Don't we wish the average church in America look like heaven's going to look. Sister, we get to heaven, a lot are going to look like me, and a lot are going to look like you. 
Because that's how God wants it to be. That's how God, are y'all okay with me, folks? We get to heaven, all nations and kindreds. God help us, God help us, God help us. That's how the church ought to look. That's how the church ought to look. Now here's what I want you to see. You say, well, Brother Benny, that sounds exciting. I believe I'll just wait to the tribulation period and give my life to Christ. Well, first of all, folks, that would be very foolish. And let me tell you about, about four quick reasons. Now, I'm almost done. I promise you. I'll tell you why that'd be so foolish. Reason number one it'd be foolish is you don't know when you're going to die. You may not make the tribulation period. James 4.14 4 says, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. You don't know when you're going to die. Let me tell you the second thing. If you've heard the gospel here, folks, you won't have an opportunity to get saved during the tribulation period. Because the Bible is very clear. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of truth, that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth. All I want to say, folks, your opportunity to get right with God is in the now and now. Let me tell you the third reason why. Why on earth would you want to endure the horrible tribulation period? Why, why would you want to endure people being beheaded? Why would you want to endure turning your water faucet on and blood flowing from it? Why would you want to endure the stings of a scorpion for five months? Why would you want to endure men crying out to mountains and saying, fall on me that I might die? Why would we want to endure that? When according to Revelation 3.10, we don't have to. And let me tell you another reason. You don't want to wait to the tribulation. Why would you want to miss a relationship with him? <laughs> let, let me say something. I love people, but I talk to the Lord more than I talk to anybody else. I talk to the Lord more than I talk to anybody. Somebody said, Brother Benny, you need to get saved because you may die. No, no, no. You need to get saved because you may live. <laughs> you need to get saved because you may live. And you get to have a relationship with him. <laughs> Folks, let me, as I was singing this morning, <laughs> I said, if I had a thousand lives to live, I'd give them all to the Lord. He's been so good to me. That's the least I can afford. He's made the good times outnumber the bad. He's been the best friend I ever had. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Folks, don't get saved because you might die. Get saved because you might live. And there's nothing like having a relationship. Oh, goodness gracious. I'm sorry, folks, but if it wasn't for my Methodist dignity, I'd shout. There's nothing like a relationship with Jesus Christ. <laughs> Let me tell you one other thing, and I'm done. There's no problem too hard for God to solve. There's no problem too hard for God to solve. A young boy came home from Sunday school and his daddy said, son, what'd you learn? He said, well, dad, the teacher told us about Moses and the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. When they came to the Red Sea, they plugged in their GPS system. The Navy SEALs helped them. They pumped up their inflatable boats and got away from Pharaoh's soldiers who were chasing them on jet skis. His father said, son, now did that really happen? He said, no, dad, but if I told you what really happened, there's no way you could believe it. Amen? <laughs> there's no problem too big for God to solve. God brought the 144,000 through, and God's going to see you through. Because listen to this preacher. 
I'm almost done. But there's no problem too big for God to solve. You don't have a problem that God can't handle. One place says this is but a light thing for God. This is but a light thing for God. I'm sorry, folks, I'm about to lose it. There's no problem too big for our God to solve, amen? There's no problem too big for our God to solve. God taught me this early on in my life. Years ago, I went out with a little girl on the second date. And I said, what do you think about marrying me? She said, I don't know. After two dates, what do you think about marrying me? I said, I'm in love. You said, Brother Benny, that's puppy love. It's real to the dogs, amen? She said, you got to talk to daddy. I said, what do you mean? Yes. She said, you've got to go to my daddy and ask my daddy for my hand in marriage. I said, you're kidding. No. So I went to Prior Ridge, Tennessee. Prior Ridge, Tennessee, a little place where a tornado went through and did $50,000 worth of improvements. Prior Ridge, Tennessee. And I pulled up there in Prior Ridge, Tennessee, driving a 79 Ford Fairmont, and said, Mr. Roberts, I want to marry your daughter. He said, no, you don't need to do that. I remember it like it's yesterday. He said, you need to get in that car and get off this mountain. I said, I don't want to do that. He said, boy, you need to get in that car and get off this mountain. You don't know what you're asking. The girl that you want to marry, he said, she's very sick. He said, I've been with her through it all. You hadn't. She ha she'll have eight or 10 seizures a day. She takes 14 to 15 pills every day. Son, you can't handle the metal, medical bills. You need to get off this mountain. I said, but I love her and I want to get married. He said, I don't recommend it. I said, well, if it's okay, I'm still going to do it. I've always been a communicator. <laughs> he said, will you do it? And we got married. We so young, we didn't know whether to go on a honeymoon or summer camp. That's a preacher. That's a preacher. That's a preacher. That's a preacher. There's Barbara. $35 dress. $35. We had nothing. It was oatmeal, cornmeal, miss a meal. Went on our honeymoon 30 minutes from where we lived. 30 minutes. Literally 30 minutes. 30 minutes from where we lived. Say, why? We didn't have no money. 30 minutes from where we lived. Barbara got sick on the honeymoon. Had to go to the hospital. Mr. Roberts was correct. Seizure after seizure after seizure have seizures and gush up blood. Sir, she'd have seizures and after the seizure was over, she'd get on the scales and weigh and she was five pounds lighter. 14 pills a day. Go to the Mayo Clinic and the Mayo Clinic said there's a scar on the brain. We wouldn't touch it surgically. If we tr attempted this surgery, it could, it could damage her could damage her greatly. It's such a risk, we can't do it. I said, okay. Go home, take the 14 pills a day. Hire somebody to stay with her. I don't know why this is coming to my mind, but I can remember an old refrigerator and our bills just piled up, piled up, piled up. 
Now I'd send this one $5 and this one $3. And just piled up, piled up, piled up. And if Barbara had came to this service, folks, when the invitation was given, she would have came down front and prayed and asked God to heal her. I saw her do it hundreds of times. And I'd wake up during the night and I'd hear her praying and she'd just say, I want to be normal like everybody else. She'd say to me, Benny, if something happens, you cover me up. Because I don't want to embarrass myself because of those seizures. She'd have a seizure at church, folks, and my mind's just running, but people call the they call the emergency people and I said, No, 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 please don't call. I've got more bills than I can pay. I'll get her out of it. Please don't call. We don't we don't we don't need the ambulance to come. You know, but you've always got some drama mamas out there. One day I came in, she said, God's touched me. I said, He has. She said, I don't have to take those 15 pills, 14 pills a day anymore. Me being a man of faith, I said, I'll tell you what you need to do. Keep taking those pills. <laughs> she said, Benny, I don't have to. God's touched me. I know God's touched me. I didn't, I didn't grow up in church. I didn't know anything about God touching people. Never experienced anything like that. Keep taking that medicine. I was running a horizontal milling machine one day and I told the Lord, I said, God, I'll make a deal with you as if I can make a deal with God. <laughs> Benny, let's make a deal. And God doesn't work about that way, folks. That was Benny's mentality. God, I'll make a deal with you as if I can make a deal with God. He's the creator of this universe. Like he's gonna stoop to my level. I said, God, I'll make a deal with you. She don't have to take the medication on the weekends, but she can take it Monday through Friday because I'm hiring somebody to stay. But on the weekends, I'm the best, God. I know how to cuff my hand over her nose and mouth. I can get her out of them faster than anybody. So I, God, we're not gonna take that medicine on the weekend. And folks, God hadn't spoken to me a thousand times, but I know this time God did speak to me. And he said these words. He said, son, what can you do that I can't do? And I said, God, I'm sorry. And I walked over to my boss, Steve Rowland, and I was crying. And I said, Steve, I've got to go home. I'm sorry. He said, what's wrong? I said, I've just got to go home. And I got in that 79 Ford Fairmont and I walked into the house and I looked at Barbara and I said, Barbara, you don't have to take the medicine anymore. 15 pills a day, you don't have to do it anymore. You don't have to do it. She said, okay. Eight or 10 seizures a day. What happened, Pastor Benny? 35 years ago, never had one since. Just stand, folks. Everybody just stand. That was before I came to Georgia. And what God was showing a young preacher, you don't have a problem too big for God to solve. And you don't either. And you don't either. And you don't either. Folks, there's no problem too. You say, God can't. Oh, yes, God can do it. Now, look. I'm not trying to really, I just want the Holy Spirit of God. I don't, I don't want anything else other than that. But just for a moment, every head's bowed and every eye's closed. Pastor Benny, I don't know that I'm right with God. I don't know that if I died, I'd go to heaven. I know you won't call my name or embarrass me. But Pastor Benny, I want you to pray for me. I don't know that I'm right with God. If you would like for me to pray for you, slip your hand in the eye, in the air. I don't know that I'm right with God. God bless you. God bless you. I'm waiting on, God bless you. I'm waiting on your hand today. Just slip your hand up, Pastor. I don't know that I'm right with God. I don't know that I'm right. Just slip your hand up. 
If you raise your hand, pray this prayer with me. Say these words with me right where you're watching, right where you're standing. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. But God, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm so sorry I want to change. I believe you died on the cross for my sin. And I confess them to you right now. Come into my heart. Come into my life, Lord. And forgive me. Now thank you, God, for forgiving me. Thank you for coming into my life. Thank you for saving me. If you prayed that prayer with me, hold your hand up real high where I can see it. I prayed it. God bless you. That's great. I, in, 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 in the foyer, I see your hand in the foyer. I sure do. Hold your hand up real high. That's it. Hold your hand up real high. I prayed that prayer with you. I prayed that prayer with you. I prayed that prayer with you. Now, folks, I want every person to look at me. So, Brother Benny, I'm in the sound booth or I'm, I'm playing the instrument. Matters not to me where you are. I'm in the foyer. It matters not to me where you are. Brother Benny, you said there's no problem too big for God to solve. Before we even start singing, if you said, Pastor, I've got a problem that is so big and I need the Lord. I'm going to invite us to come and stand around this altar, stand down these aisles, and I want to pray over you. It's because, see, you, I want you to understand something. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So I want you to just start coming from all over this house, from all over this house, just no, no, Pastor, this is for me. Pastor Benny, you're right, Brother Benny, you're right. There's no problem too big for God to solve. There's no problem too big. You say, but, but Brother Benny, it's a serious problem. I know it's a serious problem, but I want you to know, folks, it's not so big that God can't handle it. It's, it's not so big that God says, oh, I'm wringing my hands. I, I don't know what I'm gonna do with it. God can handle it, sis. God can handle it. God can handle whatever we face. He's a big enough God to handle whatever you're facing. So from all over the house, you said, Pastor Benny, I, I, I want to come. I want to come. To you You just start coming because there's no problem too big for God to solve. <laughs> oh, they're too big for me to solve. They're too big for you to solve. But they're not too big for God to solve. Amen? God can handle it, ladies and gentlemen. I promise you, God can handle it. We cast all our cares upon Him. Amen? We cast all of our cares upon Him because He careth for us. He, he's concerned about what you're going through. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you, and we love these beautiful people. And God, we're doing just what you said. We're casting all of our cares, whether it's physical, whether it's relational, whether it's our children, whether it's circumstances, whether it's our health, whether it's an estranged, estranged relationship. God, we're giving it to you because Lord, there's no problem too big for you to solve. It may be in the court system, but God, there's no problem too big for you to solve because the hand of the king is in the hands of the, the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord. So God, we just bring all of our problems. We bring all of our perplexities. We bring all of our difficulties and we place them at the feet of Jesus. We come boldly into the throne of grace because God, we know we can obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. We've come because we're in a time of need. And we give it to you, the one who can handle all of our problems. Because we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.